So, that's roughly, so why is this? Well, unknown territory, known territory You think, well, is that real? Well, it's real enough, so that's how your brain evolved That seems pretty damn real So, then we can think about it subcortically And we might as well do that This is mapped out on the hippocampus more, Most particularly by Jeffrey Gray, who is influenced by Sokolov and Vinogradova, who were also students of Luria Jeffrey Gray used cybernetic theory that was developed by Norbert Wiener and, which is an AI uh, which, he, he was the father of artificial intelligence and some of that was actually integrated as well into Piagetian thought because Piaget and Wiener, Norbert Wiener and Luria, if I remember correctly, all went to the same conference back in the early 1920s mid 1920s and heard Norbert Wiener speak so that's how cybernetic theory got built into some of these underlying theories and sort of manifested itself everywhere so Gray, Gray uses a model very much like this derived from cybernetic theory and so here's the idea how does the brain work you have a target in mind then you act to, to manifest the target you act to transform the world into the target and then you compare the consequence of your actions to the target and if they match, then that's a good thing, and if they don't match, then that's what ne where negative emotion comes from Okay, so how does that work? The hippocampus seems to be central to that So it detects mismatch So, so in the classic behavioral theory, so this would be Gray's theory You have your expectations of the world, so that would be your model And you have your sensory input, which is the real world And then the hippocampus is mapping one onto the other one from a top downstream, one from a bottom upstream and saying match, 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 match and as long as everything matches then the hippocampus this is an oversimplification keeps the subcortical emotional systems inhibited because you don't need them except for maybe my, mild positive emotion to keep you moving forward if there's a mismatch that's anxiety the anxiety system gets disinhibited because it's on, it doesn't get activated, it gets disinhibited that freezes you and all the other motivational systems are primed because God only knows what you're going to have to do next okay, so then if you make a mistake given that scheme you have to modify the world in order to rectify the mistake you have to modify your motor output so that you put the world back in order and that's basically Gray's model but Gray's model is insufficient because Gray presumes that what you're comparing your expectation with is the real world but you don't have access to the real world what really happens is that your brain compares the model of the world that you want to have happen so it's desired and not expected with the model of the world that you think is happening they're both models there's no direct contact with the truth and so what that means, and this is what's horrible about this, is that if your model fails, it doesn't only mean that you have to adjust your expectation and change your motor activity it means you might have to bloody well retool your perceptions well that's a lot more horrifying than just having to change your motor output if you betray me then I have to see you differently and you know, I've, if we've interacted a long time, I've built up a hell of a model of you you know, it's taken a tremendous amount of effort to generate and I may have used that model as a predicate for all sorts of other plans which is what you do with an intimate relationship and so then if you do something that indicates a true mismatch it isn't only that I have to adjust my actions God only knows what I'm going to have to retool I may even have to retool my perceptions of myself I'm a lot more gullible than I thought I was, for example and God only knows what the implications of that are if you're close to me and you could do this to me is that my flaw? and if I'm, am I carrying that into other relationships? it's an absolute catastrophe and so Gray actually underestimated the degree of severity of mismatch because he only said, well, it was motor output and, 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 re, and re-world adjusting that would have to be repaired, not perception because like most behaviorists, see the behaviorists had this idea of stimulus, right? the stimulus produces the response it's like, okay, what stimulus? well, they never went there they just assumed that the stimulus spoke for itself but it doesn't that's the fundamental weakness of behavioral theory is that the reason they could get rid of the mind was because they hid it invisibly inside the idea of the stimulus which was all of a sudden not just something that was a sense like a piece of sense data, but that had motivation built into it well, no you, no, you can't do that the, the motivation 
you can put the motivation in the object, but then it's no longer an object, it's something completely different so, alright, so, back this chaos, this is the birthplace of things, that's why often it's represented as feminine because feminine things are the birthplace of things, now again, you know people are stuck with the necessity of interpreting their experience through the biological platform of interpretation that they evolved and so we could say, well, we, we recognize feminine, we recognize masculine, we recognize parent, we recognize child and that's, that's ancient, right? that's as ancient as mammals and so those are fundamental social cognitive categories and we had to exploit those categories to represent the world beyond that, when we started to be able to represent the world beyond that as a, just as a primate, like a, a chimpanzee or a tree dwelling primate, a complex primate almost all of their categories are social cognitive right, why? because they live in complex social environments and there's a relationship be between the size of the social environment that a primate inhabits and its brain size the bigger the brain, the larger the environment and you could think there's a loop there, right? If your brain's too small, you can't handle the larger environment. So the environment grows and it selects for people, for creatures that are complex enough to compute the environment, and then that gives a selective advantage to creatures that are acute or, or, or sharp enough to compute the environment, and so there's more of them, and it loops, and the brain grows. I mean, it's not the only thing driving the evolution of the brain among primates, but it's, it's a primary source. So we have those categories to begin with, and then we have to view the world as it manifests itself outside those primary categories through the lens of those categories and so what happens is we use the symbolism of, of sex differentiation and the symbolism of parent-child relationships to, to begin to account for the manner in which the world manifests itself masculine, why? well that's the patriarchy chaos, feminine, why? Well, partly it's conceived of in opposition to the patriarchy, but more importantly, it's the thing from which order rises So it's perfectly reasonable to consider it feminine, and then order again, and then the question is, well You have order, father, chaos, mother, and then you have this, this transformational process, well that's the mythological hero And those are the three fundamental characters of mythology, individual culture, nature, right? it's the universal world, and then that's differentiated further positive individual, negative individual, hero and adversary tyrant and wise king the destructive element of nature and the creative element of nature and, and those are perfectly reasonable categories, they, they do a lovely job of actually representing how the world does manifest itself to us in the domains that are permanent there's always a conscious observer, who's ambivalent about the nature of the world there's always a social structure that's half tyrannical and half order producing and there's always the nature that gives rise to everything and that destroys it at the same time always, it's permanent and so that's another reason, it's, it's so interesting, that's another reason why the mythological representations are hyper real because they, you think, what makes something real? let's say protons are real why? because at one level of analysis, every single thing is made out of protons so you can use it as an explanatory tool, the concept, you can use it as an explanatory tool for every possible situation, and it's true across all possible spans of time although protons do decay, but it takes billions and billions of years so real means, works now, and works forever, applies now, and applies everywhere well, that's exactly what this map means it's that there's always an observer, there's always a framework of interpretation and there's always that which is being observed there's always the, the individual, there's always the social environment the dominance hierarchy and there's always the nature that exists outside of that there's always the knower, the known, and the unknown always so then the question is, well, how do those things interrelate? Well, you differentiate them into their positive and negative elements, because there's always the positive and negative element, and then you tell stories about how the different categories interact, and that's what the stories do. And the more mythological the story, the more that underlying schema is self-evident in the in the in the plot. 
And you especially see that, I think, in stories for children. And maybe that's because children can't understand stories unless they're archetypal. Like, blatantly archetypal. And that would make sense, right? Because the stories have to appeal to the instinctive knowledge of the child. Or the child wouldn't be able to comprehend them. And so, you know, I've, I saw this quite dramatically with my own kids, watching them watch Disney movies, for example. My, my son was absolutely obsessed with Pinocchio. And particularly obsessed with the scene where Pinocchio and, and his father are escaping from the whale, and the whale turns into this sort of smoke belching locomotive thing that's chasing them through the water. He would rewind that and watch it, and rewind it and watch it, and rewind it and watch it, like over and over and over. And you think, well, what, what the hell's that kid up to? Well, you know, it took us, what, six hours to do a brief run through through Pinocchio still by still. There's a lot of information in that movie, a tremendous amount of information. And then what the kid's trying to do is to incorporate it, to, to understand it, to embody it. And that's all happening in some sense, I would say, unconsciously. It's like it's unconscious in that he couldn't articulate what he was doing, and neither could anyone else. But that doesn't mean he wasn't doing something. He was definitely doing something. He was doing the same thing that enabled my nephew to put on the, the night suit when he did that, the little knight hat and the sword, and figure out how to go after the great dragon of chaos.